I talked about that. Placenta. It turns out that actually the placenta, which is really one of the unsung parts of the human anatomy, it sort of gets tossed after birth. And some people eat it, I think. At least a naturopath used to eat it. <laughs> but basically, um, it's kind of like your evil twin when you were being born. Your placenta really was like, it was like your big brother who would beat up on you when your parents weren't looking. It was kind of like the Eddie Haskell of your fetal period. Because in essence, your placenta always gets first dibs on everything. So the placenta is the first to get the oxygen. The placenta is first to get the glucose. The placenta is first to get all the nutrients, proteins. It regulates acidity. After it's happy, then the rest goes to the embryo. So it's a very interesting dynamic. The embryo is at the end of a tether with the placenta essentially almost acting with what we call in, 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 in engineering terms a transducer. It's, trans, it's, trans, trans, it's transmuting the mother's elements into fetal things, but it's taking its tax. It's taking its toll of things. Well, things that basically go on to encourage variations in placental function are major influences on epi, epigenetic uh, gene uh, regulation. So the placenta is a major epigenetic organ because much of that programming of, you know, now you got the gene, so now we're going to basically set it for you, is done at this level. And this, of course, is where often society really fails. This is where people often smoke and drink and don't eat well and all sorts of things. You know, I know you, some of you guys are dietitians and stuff, right? You heard of the French paradox, right? Why French people don't get heart disease and stuff? Everybody thought maybe it's the wine they drink, or maybe it's the garlic that they drink. It turns out, since the Franco-Prussian War, the French government has had a very aggressive policy of infant, maternal, and prenatal nutrition. So for instance, if you happen to be a, a pregnant mother in France or a young child, the government gives you incredible amounts of high quality food. And that's probably the epigenetic effect that makes French people later on so resistant <laughs> to the same effects that other people who were not prepared the same way. And think about it, 1871, so that's a few generations they've been doing this. So you can think that that improvement has been epigenetically programmed into those people over several generations. Thrifty phenotype is the human version of the agouti mouse. This came out of a, uh, a study that was done in Holland where they, they analyzed during World War II Dutch people that starved. You know, the Dutch had a tremendous famine in World War II and they starved, many people starved to death. They went back and looked at the record keeping that the Dutch took at that time and looked at the offspring that were conceived, carried, or born during that hunger period after, during World War II. When they followed them later on, they discovered inordinately high rates of autism, inordinately rates of high, uh, hypertension, schizophrenia, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Not even necessarily in the generation that was following the one, the one that was born after the famine, but in that generation afterwards. And this was posited essentially as something called the thrifty phenotype. They say that the maternal environment re re reflected a conditioning as almost as if the mother could program the fetus in a way that said, it's terrible out there. Optimize all your assimilation functions because it's famine. It's, there's a starvation environment out there. So the fetus begets programmed for thriftiness. So if you want to understand what that means, think about a thrifty person when it comes to finances, right? A thrifty person who is financially thrifty saves all his money. Well, a thrifty person metabolically saves all their calories. So where's the disconnect? What happens when you're programmed for thriftiness prenatally, but you come out into a post-war war, uh, post world, there's no thriftiness. If anything, the Dutch eat more fat, more useless calories than most Europeans. There's a disconnect. Now we've got large amounts of thriftiness in our society, and we've got an abundant amount of easy calories, easy fats, large amounts of sugar. There's the disconnect. That's why we have a diabetes epidemic, but our diabetes epidemic is going to pale in comparison to the one that you're going to see as countries like India and countries like China start to come online where you've had thriftiness for generations and generations, and now a major change to an industrialized diet. Hox body plan, I don't want to go through this a little bit, but you know, again, we understand that segmentation is a way of looking at gene function. So when you look at the genotype diet, it's kind of odd because it's a book on genetics and diet that doesn't require genetic testing. Number one, I'm, I'm a parsimonious person by nature, so I never really wanted to come up with expensive tests and things. Number two, I remain to be convinced that all those genetic tests really do very much. And number three, 
it turns out, like, like Sigmund Freud said a long time ago, anatomy is destiny. So if you study anatomy, you chart destiny. So if you go back and look at anatomical reflections of certain elements in a person's developmental process, you chart their destiny to a certain degree. And it turns out that the single most e easy way to understand that is to look at your length of this finger and compare it to the length of this finger, D2, D4 ratio. It turns out that correlates to a series of genes called the Hox genes, which control your body segmentation. And a man basically, I think, is uh, uh, Manning, looked at D2, D4 as a reflection of being able to understand the amount of androgenic versus estrogenic stimulation in utero and a reflection of this Hox gene function. Now, I want to spend some time with that because as you go through the genotype diet or pass, when you talk to people, you're going to have them ask you, like, why am, why am I measuring my finger? Right? What's that going to tell me about my genes? Well, it could tell you, amongst other things, essentially, whether or not you had time in an estrogenizing environment, masculinizing environment. The studies support that. Women, for instance, who have longer ring fingers than index fingers get sick like men. So the association is that longer ring finger, longer D4, tends to indicate a longer time or a more androgenizing time in utero. Longer index finger, more estrogenizing time. Men with higher D2 to D4 ratios tend to get sick in female type ways, reproductive, more hormonally sensitive things, prostate cancer. On the other hand, women who have, women normally have their index finger longer, men normally ring finger, but when it's reverted, like women who have this finger longer, get more heart attacks, more type A behavior, more anxiety, all the, th all the things men have. One of the things we do with the book in terms of the test we ask people to do is look for asymmetry. Asymmetry is simply just how much the left side of you is like the right side of you. Turns out that actually the difference between the left side of you and the right side of you is a singular most sensitive indicator of developmental instability known to biology. So if you ask a biologist to tell you how well the lobsters are doing in Long Island Sound, he's going to measure the amount of symmetry on one claw to the other. And, he, and basically he's going to say, hey, they're doing pretty good. Look at this, one claw looks like this. Well, you're going to be, oh man, there's something going on because look, we've got one claw like this and one claw like this. So fluctuating asymmetry is a direct correlation to developmental instability. The more unstable your developmental environment was, the more your placenta was cheating you out of oxygen, the more it wasn't regulating the acidic environment because your mother was smoking, the more basically the glucose con concentrations were going up and down really high because your mom was eating a lot of ring dings. The more unstable your development, the more you used DES, the more, the more basically you took pharmaceuticals, the more you had xenobiotics in your environment, the more the left side of you is not going to look like the right side of you. And so you can measure that, amongst other things, by looking at fingerprints, book matching fingerprints. Is this fingerprint like this? This fingerprint like this? This fingerprint like this? This fingerprint like this? Okay, one sensitive indicator of fluctuation. There's better ones, but they're a little hard for the average Joe to do. Most people can take a piece of paper and an ink pad and go like this and go, oh, I got a whirl, I got a loop. It's not very hard. 